Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Skura. I'm the moderator, uh, and we welcome you today to the third party risk management uh, virtual briefing. Uh, glad to have members here and guests as well. I'm going to wait just a couple of minutes uh, just for people to be logging in, and then we're going to uh, kick off the discussion shortly. So, again, thanks for joining. Uh, I might want to remind members that if you uh, go to the member portal, you can certainly pull down uh, the deliverables that we put together, uh, the guide and the, uh, the toolkit. So please do, and you can follow along. So we'll be starting in just another moment. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so members uh, have logged in and uh, the guests as well. Again, I'm Tom Skura. I'm the VP of Content and Programs uh, for the Cybersecurity Collaborative. And I'm joined today uh, by our panelists, uh, Sheldon Cuffey, who's the CISO of American uh, Family Insurance. And joined uh, with Sheldon as well is Andy Fumafetto, who's the Enterprise IT Third Party Cyber Risk Manager with American Family Insurance as well. Andy was a key member on our task force and will be uh, joining me to uh, answer your questions and talk about some of the experiences that we had on the task force as well. So I'd like to uh, turn this over to uh, uh, Sheldon, who's a member of our executive committee, uh, an esteemed member of that, and he's joined with a number of other executive committee members who oversee uh, our organization and make sure that members are satisfied and provide guidance for the teams and work we do. Among the members on the committee are Tim Callahan, the global CISO of AFLAC, Meredith Harper, the VP and CISO of Eli Lilly, and Mark Varner, the global CISO of Young Brands. So we are very grateful for all our executive members. We're grateful for Sheldon being here today. I know Sheldon, you have, as a CISO, so many things going on that you can't uh, stay with us for a long period of time. But we're so grateful for all of all the uh, guidance you've, and help you provided us, of course, having Andy here today. So I'm going to turn this over to you to uh, sort of kick off the uh, session. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are uh, in the country or in the world, for that matter. And, you know, really happy to be here with with all of you to uh, present this uh, material. Uh, along with Tom and, and Andy. Um, it is a, a privilege and, uh, you know, really humbled to share this, this information with everybody on behalf of our peer CISOs and organizations uh, that worked on this uh, with, with our company uh, and the Cybersecurity Collaborative. Uh, the one thing I know in cybersecurity is that uh, this is a team sport. Uh, we are all dependent on each other, and the more we can leverage best practices, share threat intelligence, uh, and connect with each other on, you know, tough, challenging problems, that makes an already difficult problem at least somewhat easier. So, uh, in that vein, that's why I'm, you know, proud to be a member of the Cybersecurity Collaborative, uh, you know, supporting the Executive Committee and, you know, all of my counterparts on that group. Um, so. Well, we're, we're going to jump right right into this and, you know, present our third party risk uh, management framework. And so uh, I'll kick it back to you, Tom, and, and we can uh, uh, drop right into this. Thank you, Sheldon, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I just want to take a second too to talk about the collaborative and, and, and what we do and what it means to be a, a member, which is really to uh, piggyback on what uh, Sheldon had uh, provided us. Um, I just want to remind everyone we are a membership community. Uh, we don't have any vendor influence. Doesn't mean in our task force uh, we don't talk. You know, we certainly talk about some of the tools we're using and the challenges and how to work them. Uh, but vendors, uh, we don't represent any vendors. Uh, they don't provide any funding uh, for our operations. You know, our mission is to help cybersecurity leaders be successful. Um, this is. I've been in this field for a long, long time, and it's always difficult, changing, and challenging. 
uh, having peers and people to collaborate with made a, a great successful difference to me uh, when I was in a CISO role a long time ago. Uh, we want you to uh, benefit from that. And we want you and your staff to be good leaders, your staff so that they can also uh, progress and uh, assume more management responsibilities as you see fit. Um, and we do that because we tap into the knowledge and the expertise of our, our CISOs and cyber uh, security leaders. Um, we understand that everyone has different challenges. Uh, I, I can guarantee you ransomware is one that we're all facing. We have common ones. And we try to build programs around your specific challenges. And uh, the value that you get for being a member of the collaborative is uh, not only saving resources, validating your strategy and leadership development, um, we raise your profile on the national stage. And again, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration in planned meetings and also uh, instantaneously when you can get it, it is something you can't get anywhere else. And, and this is what we provide. You can see on the left of the slide, our member benefits. We have a library of CISO developed tools and resources. It's amazing how much uh, we're getting now into that library that uh, CISOs are, are volunteering and their staffs. Um, we have CISO boardrooms and task force working groups. Uh, the daily morning report is something you get early every morning. It comes out about six or 6.30 Eastern time. Uh, so you know what's going on, major breaches, vulnerabilities, uh, it, it's a great, uh, well-written report, summarizes, and you'll never be caught uh, with your management finding out something before you do. Um, secure peer-to-peer -peer direct messaging. We have some great systems that allow you to collaborate. A 12-week cyber leadership, uh, uh, security leadership program, really, really uh, excellent around bringing your operations and incident response leaders into, into how to deal with... Uh, with different types of incidents and uh, collaborate with others that have to resolve those interest, uh, incidents. National visibility and mentorship opportunities. And we have a CISO Ask the Expert Rapid Response. So as a CISO, when you have an immediate need, uh, we have a, a vehicle for you to, uh, to uh, get uh, answers from your peers on those needs. So again, it's, it's, it's a very unique opportunity. We're continuing to uh, learn and build from each other. And all of us are here to help each other uh, given the challenges that we have. So on the virtual briefing topics today, uh, this is what we'll talk about. Uh, third party threats are real and now. I guess that's a, uh, a not a wow statement because we all uh, recognize third party threats. That's why we're here. Um, what was surprising to me is, is, is the magnitude of these things and uh, the trajectory as well. well. We'll talk a little bit about that. Of course, I'm going to rely on, on Andy to, uh, uh, to, to, to chime in with his experience on the, on the task force. Um, as, as we see here, he'll give us a little background and mainly talk about how, how, the, how the task force work, what value people get out of them, uh, I know we're creating great content uh, that, that uh, prospects, hopefully me new members will, will leverage and our existing members will leverage. But so much is gained in, the, in, in those individual meetings that we have, you know, where your teams can ask specific questions and, uh, and we, we document what those are and get, get specific answers and then collaborate just, you know, again, if it's a tool you're trying to put in and uh, another partner has that tool, you can kind of work together uh, to uh, resolve some of the issues. So we'll, we'll hear from Andy on that. And then I'm gonna take us through the three deliverables uh, that the task force put together. Uh, the first is a, is a program implementation guide. It's kind of a, a full look at the program, what you need to do uh, to, to make it successful, effective and efficient. The second is a standard. Um, if you've got a security program, you certainly have policies and standards. We've got a template for you that you can leverage right away. And the third thing is a workbook, uh, something that can immediately get you started with inventorying your uh, third parties and also for administering uh, security uh, questionnaires. Um, we'll talk about our continuing work in this area. This is not done. Uh, we're gonna be having another task force coming up on it. Uh, new task force initiatives that will be coming down the pike of the rest of this year. And we'll follow that up with, it, with the Q&A at the end. So let me just take our attention here. Yes, third-party threats are real and now. I, 
we, we did a little bit of research internally. Um, I know most members have heard of the Ponemon Institute. Uh, there's a data risk in the third party ecosystem. It's called an ecosystem here, the third annual study. Ponemon's been around for years. I remember looking at their breach reports and then tracking stuff back in 2005. But what's surprising here, and uh, you know, Andy, maybe you wanna chime in on this if you're as surprised as I am, maybe I'm just you know, <laughs> the only one here. Of those responding, 59% uh, 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 experienced uh, a third party breach, which I thought was rather interesting. Now you, you kind of look at the sample size and who they're surveying, but that's pretty high. The majority, vast majority, believe that the number of third-party incidents is increasing. I think we all got scared with the solar winds deal. Only 50% evaluate the security and privacy practices of all third parties before engaging them. 50%. Uh, so I kind of looked at that number and thought, well, does that mean we're not doing our jobs? I don't believe that's the case. I think the problem is uh, others aren't letting us do our jobs. Maybe that's a little disingenuous. Meaning it's hard, it's hard to uh, get a handle on uh, you know all the third parties that we have to evaluate. Call from hard screen. Excuse me a second. Sorry about that. The other um, surprising um, uh, statistics was that forty five percent inventory all of their third parties. Um, if you're ISO 2701 certified, uh, you're required to, to have an inventory of all those in scope. So it's very surprising that only 45% have that. Again, I think the basic problem is how you identify all the third parties in scope. And we'll talk about that. We have guidance uh, around that. And the last is the 38% receive third party notification when the data is shared with fourth parties. So um, Andy, what, what do you think about that? Is that surprising to you? <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, thanks, Tom. It's it's pretty funny. So I'll give you guys a little perspective from the you know boots on the ground and how this works and, and what I see, uh, you know, from from our supply chain and what's going on. Now, first off, what I'll say is the thing that surprises me most about all those numbers is only three quarters of the companies out there think that incidents are increasing. That means they're not paying attention to the news. They're not paying attention to what's going on, and they're not taking those threats seriously. Maybe they're isolated a little bit. Maybe they don't get uh, as big a target on their back as some other companies do. Uh, insurance always is a good one. We have a lot of data. Uh, banking, obviously, there's a lot of money there. But you know, honestly, I think that today that that's the thing that surprises me most. We all have to be aware um, of what's going on. And solar winds changed everything for us. The new capabilities that were were uh, realized by those threat actors and what they could do, not just to our, the government or larger entities, but the smaller ones as well. So. What I, would, what I would say was, is anybody approaching these programs, please make sure that you're in the know what's going on. Um, I guarantee you that if you know your owners of your business, your, your board of directors, they should be caring about cyber incidents and they should be caring about how that affects them. So if, if they're not, that's maybe a point to bring that up and say, what do they want? What are their expectations from that? Now, from there and the knowledge of that is, is just one thing, a couple of things. Now, I'll, I'll kind of work through some of these and what I see now. I do think 50 to, you know, 50 to 60% is probably accurate. Um, you know, now there's a term we use, there's a difference between third party breach and third party incident. Now it's getting a little tactical here, but realistically, you know, if we're saying a breach is, you know, I'm gonna use a definition, uh, is the data has been compromised or exfiltrated from a company. That's one way, one way of thinking about it. The other one is, did they just, someone get past their, their perimeter? Did they get past the front gates and are they in, in the system? Now, if they were, you know, if it's an incident, which is the one I go to, that would be 60, 60% would be actually a pretty good number for that. Uh, exfiltration of data, that's a scary number, but I wouldn't discredit it either. I also think that could be, um, you know, very accurate to where the landscape is. We're seeing, you know, constant threats in our supply chain. I'm aware every single week of suppliers, we, some we use, some we don't, but every single week um, they're being targeted by ransomware. And by the way, I was gonna make a joke when I started this off, we should probably take a drink every time we say ransomware because that is happening every single day. Um, one of the things I, I, I found kind of funny <laughs> is that, uh, yeah, one of the things I found funny with this is that, you know, I was thinking about, you said 2005, and I was thinking back to like, where was I in 2005 and what was I doing? What were some of the big things? I'll fast forward a little bit. I remember the first big incident that I was responsible or I heard of was WannaCry and part of Heartbleed and, and those things. Now, 
that wasn't all too long ago from for us who's been around, but it was a very different threat back then. And, and the things you had to be aware of, the things you try to control were very different. Um, today, I mean, you, you don't have to even worry about what's coming in. You have to worry about your suppliers being compromised and now encryption keys are compromised and how they get into your system. So mm -hmm. where I'm going with this is, I think these, these uh, numbers are legitimate, but more importantly, I think the threats behind them are even more legitimate. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, we try to focus on in our collaboration on how do you get uh, a company just started in this process? How do you get their feet wet to get going? You, you know, if I can say, interject here, because uh, I think you reminded me of something going, going back even earlier, you talked about WannaCry and I go back to Slammer, uh, you know. <laughs> and what, well, that actually shut down our network. But I, I think uh, what, what now I remember about that is we forensically traced it back to a third party providing uh, the uh, worm, I guess, that came into, in, into our networks. And uh, open, they had a lot of high open ports in the application that were taken advantage of by this particular you know, threat uh, that we actually uh, had raised as a security risk that was accepted as a risk. So I just wanted to say, you know, Sheldon, I don't know. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> you, you try to bring up what these are, but management has to make the decision. And, and lo and behold, that's what happened and shut us down for an entire weekend, so. Yeah, well, let me piggyback on that for a minute, Tom. And that's why uh, we were really interested in when this task force was announced, uh, I may have been one of the first people in that said, yep, we want to get involved in this because at the time, and just to share a little bit of our journey here, uh, American Family is going through this massive transformation from, uh, you know, we're fastly moving up in the Fortune 200 and probably by next year we'll, we'll break through that uh, Fortune 100 seal, you know, in, into the Fortune 100s. But we are consolidating uh, multiple programs from multiple insurance companies into one company. And so that's where Andy uh, Fenofredo comes in. He was with one of those companies that was acquired and uh, needed to bring together this enterprise third-party risk management framework. Uh, in parallel, what we were seeing, and I think your numbers start to illustrate this, is we've seen over 18 of our suppliers in the past 20 months hit by ransomware. Wow. So some type of operational impact to a part of our company, whether it's a call center, whether it's a tax uh, provider, uh, you know, uh, uh, big uh, one of the big four IT service providers, right? So uh, this this is very much so. I think folks used to think about third-party risk management as the people that review contracts and put terms and conditions in those. This is much more than that. Uh, this is a connected piece in our cyber defense as a company. So uh, really important uh, capability that, that Andy has stood up here. Well, thank thank you, Sheldon, for that. And I'm glad you you'll be able to spend a little time. Just got got the new the good news that you'll be yeah, spending. Thank you. <laughs> so, so that's 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 well. Of course, we never know what's going to happen, right? But it, you know that's that's part of the game here. Well, you mentioned. Um, I'm just going to just continue on here. Uh, you know, some of the threat vectors, uh, the, the common ones were third party. You know, access to the entities, networking systems. You know, poor access management. We saw that with Target. You know, unfortunately, it, it, it happened to them. Um, but you, you did talk about uh, ransomware and you just met, you just gave some very good examples. Not only is there concern of loss of, of availability, but it, it, it can be a vector for, for uh, phishing emails. I've seen that in clients where uh, uh, Dropbox was comprom compromised. There's a business process that didn't use Dropbox, but then the client thought, oh, my third parties changed the business pro process to use Dropbox, clicked on it, and then there you go. I mean, it's very, very deceptive. So ransomware, and we're going to have a, a task force on that one. And you know, we'd love to have you and Andy, you know, as much as possible on these things. I know you got work to do, uh, but poor data protections, um, lack of encryption or key management, weak pa weak passwords and multi, uh, you know, weak passwords and lack of multi-factor authentication are a major vector for. Um, activists now. I mean, still, you know, like penetration testers that will test to that. And then, uh, of course, software vulnerabilities and malicious code, we, 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 we talked through that. 
and uh, we'll be uh, engaged in that. But absolutely, thanks. Thank you for sharing some of those um, real experiences. We kind of touched on um, reasons for forming the task force and DPRM challenges. And Andy brought some things up in the in the value from collaboration. I didn't know if uh, Sheldon, Andy, you wanted to. You know, Andy, you were you were on the task force. If you wanted to share any specific um, value and insights you got from the other peers during the meetings, that, you know, uh, or anything else about the value to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, first off, I'll say you know, thank you to all the people who participated in that event, and there was a lot. Um, and I wouldn't do it justice if I try to a try to look up the names and get them. But I, for those who were involved, I want to give you the guys kudos because not only did I learned a lot. Uh, through that process and, and discovering what different industries face. But I also saw opportunities I could take back to my own team uh, and implement them for, for our industry. Now, a lot of things that we, we talked about today and, and things we'll highlight here is that I'm a firm believer in education. Same thing as Sheldon said. Uh, if we make each other stronger by, by providing education, tools, data to our partners, even our competitors, they're using that information to help go to their supply chains and their vendors to protect their data. Now, you know, we're in insurance and if we're working with the uh, State Farm, for example, who's also insurance, a lot of those vendors are, are the same. You know, with those, they're the major insurance tech vendors. There's only so many that are there. So when State Farm is, is pushing them to improve, that benefits us and vice versa. So, you know, the reason for providing that task force uh, and giving those capabilities is, is to have people just start doing something, right? Something we're gonna do to move the needle forward, identify the risks, start having the conversations, um, which by the way, there's, there's one thing I always like to do. Someone always asks, someone always asks what, how do you start you know, evaluating risks? How do, you, how do you dive into this program and, and begin it? And I'll tell you this, you can look at every single template, you can look at every single white paper, you can listen to all the webinars and all the podcasts. Everybody needs to start by just asking the questions, what is most important to you and what are the threats that you're worried about? Yeah, I go to Sheldon, I go to my other AVPs, all my C-level, ask them, because that's where risk management starts. You understand what their threats, what their concerns are, and then you work back from there to go through it. These templates will help support that initiative. But I'll also put out there, we're all in different industries, insurance, healthcare, government, we have different challenges. We have different threats that are trying to get a hold of our data or our, our systems. So therefore, we all have to find out the right way to approach it. That's why I said when you start somewhere, start with asking the questions. Don't start with, hey, hey, I need a program. Let me start with a template. That only gets you halfway. Putting in a program without a process, you know, I, there, was a, there was an old saying, someone I used to work or uh, work with at, uh, not work with, but knew at uh, Northwest Mutual, and they would say, a fool with a tool is still a fool which means you have to understand your processes before you put all this stuff together in order to enable it. So, you know, with that, Tom, that's a big part of it. You know, talking about forming the task force and the, and the reasons for that, sharing knowledge, start somewhere, you know? Yeah, you, you know, I, I love what you said, you know, across industry or even in the same industry, and we do have companies in the same industries, you know, is, you know, it, it isn't proprietary. You know, we, we maintain our proprietary positions by, having good defenses. So we share our defense information to maintain our good proprietary services. And it's not that, you know, and, and that's why, you know, it's good. I mean, people really provide their templates. We have a template that uh, we'll show at the end, uh, at least the cover for, that's a data addendum that goes on a third party contract to protect the company that is uh, written by the legal department that members can use. It's wonderful. I know that the company spent time putting it together and time and capital, but, you know, the members appreciate that, what, what is provided and, and, and that returns value to the company. So I, I think you hit it on the head there. So I'm going to, you know, in the interest of time, and I really do appreciate, um, you know, the comments that, that uh, you and Sheldon are providing here. Um, I'll, I'll need to get through some of the implementation guide. I got a question, where, where are these as, as members? They're in the member portal. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, you can, you can pull these out, but if you, if you don't have them now, bear with us and we'll make sure you're able to get these, you know, after the webinar. Um, the first thing that uh, 
the team put together is a program implementation guide. Now we've kind of uh, put the uh, table of contents on the right side. I think mainly so you can see the thought processes of going through this. And uh, I'll just uh, state uh, that we believe there are six uh, components required for an effective holistic program. This is a guide. Um, of course, you're going to figure out the six of them. We have uh, oversight, exec executive oversight. I think really understanding and communicating what the threats are with the executive team is very important, as, as, as Andy and, and Sheldon have uh, told us about. Um, but for a holistic program, too, you, you, know, you need that oversight, as I mentioned. Uh, you need metrics. And they're, uh, you know, we've actually come up with a few efficiency and effectiveness metrics. I believe we're gonna get more into how you measure those things, because I think it's important to, uh, when you measure and show senior management, you are using your resources effectively and actually uh, mitigating risks. Uh, you get more impetus to, to uh, continue on with the program and enhance it. Um, so we talk about the six compo success components and we, we elaborate on those. One of them is, and, and Andy, you came up with this one, that, you know, in your team, uh, the five life cycle, six life life cycle processes. Um, this isn't anything new, um, but we'll we'll talk a little bit about how we approach these on the team. Uh, life one is supplier identification, classification, assessment, management, monitoring, and termination is absolutely key. Uh, we we've, we talked about that. You may terminate a relationship with supplier that they still may have access uh, to your uh, servers or environments. So you have to be very careful with that. The other thing is um, every, there are companies uh, that have 40 or 50 people worldwide working on this. Um, you know, actually just do third party evaluations. There are companies that hire consulting firms and their staffs to go through and report on this. This is how important it is. Um, but efficiency is is key because you can't you have only so much so many hours in the day and so many people to do it. So we've given you some tips for triaging work efforts based on risk class, um, and and uh, we'll go through those as well. And then uh, lastly, we have FAQs, uh, five or six uh, major questions that people ask, and some appendices. So I'm just going to draw your attention to this um, for each of the life cycle phases. We, we um, this is an example of the supplier classification life cycle phase. Uh, we have uh, an objective statement. We list the processes within that phase. Here, there's, there's one, but others have multiple ones. And then uh, if there are any criteria, inputs, or systems that need to be involved in this phase, we identify those. So here, um, we have some uh, criteria for, it's only some for high tier risk class. We have medium and low tier. We have a, th a three class uh, schema here. And that gives good guidance to help you decide which, how am I going to analyze which set of uh, third parties, in which class uh, do they fall? The thing that I think um, I really liked, Andy, that, that came out of our work were the tips for effective processing. And this is what you get in the collaborative sessions. Like, what really works? Well, I don't want to have six risk classes, because it's very hard then to to manage those because there's a lot of overlap. So, you know, we recommended limiting the number of risk classes. And there are, there are a series of tips for, for effectiveness that's in that guidance document. So even if you have a good process, uh, you're getting uh, uh, good advice uh, in this document from as a result of the collaborative effort, efforts from the team. Uh, just be conscious of time. Uh, the, the triaging uh, uh, piece to this Again, uh, what, what you need to do is your assessment methods, the frequency, how you treat risks, how you monitor, what you put in contracts uh, will likely vary uh, between the different, uh, among the three tiers, the high tier, the medium tier, and the lower tier. And uh, sometimes contract language is the same, but with the higher tier ones, there if there's some remediation efforts that need to be identified, they'll be put in. Um, and a good best practice is, that, well, we'll talk about this when we come to, come to the questionnaire. I'll, I'll, I'll hold it on that. So um, this provides the criteria, the methods, and, and the third parties. So I don't know, Sheldon and, and, uh, and Andy, 
do you use a similar, uh, I mean, everyone varies a little bit. Do you, do you use a similar approach on this? Do you find that, you know, you're, uh, or, or are there some other variation to this that, that works for you? Yeah, so, so just the, the basics is, yeah, because at the end of the day, you have, we all have a lot of vendors, many of us have a lot of vendors that we share data with. Mm -hmm. And the scope of that varies. And, and you can have someone doing this very, I'll use insurance as an example here, someone who does auto body work for a claim service, right? They get personal information, it comes in scope, we want to protect it. But how far do you take that assessment? What do you want to do? What are you trying to hit? And what, do you, what risks are you evaluating? Or do I go to the insurance systems, right? The ones that are hosting our, our backbone to our company and make sure those are the ones buttoned up and, and really diving deep into those risks. So as, as everybody approaches this, and I, I, I say this as Sheldon mentioned earlier on, which we're transforming multiple companies in enterprise service, we're taking on a lot of work from companies that were all varying levels of maturity in this area. Um, if we try to assess every single supplier coming in, every single vendor, we'll be here for years. Instead, we have to look at highest risk, categorize it. That's an important part I wanna to touch on here and how we can move this needle forward. One of the most effective ways to start off is really just doing your identification, understanding how they're connected to your environment, understand what they have access to, and then making sure you know where those access points are. If you have a cyber event that's going to happen and hit your, one of your vendors, you need to know what they, what they can touch. Maybe they're isolated and they can't get into your environment. That's okay, right? But if they have, uh, maybe they have a, a support accounts, you know, administrative accounts in your systems, and you find out they have comprom uh, compromised credentials in their own company, hmm. you should be shutting those down right away. And the way I help our cyber fusion team and, and American family is enabling them through the risk assessment processes up front identify those threat vectors and making sure that they can uh, shut those gates when it happens. You know, I know Sheldon, from your perspective, a lot of that identification and things that come up to your level, um, I don't know if you could share a couple of those perspectives on, on things that you guys track um, on the, the senior leadership side of certain things. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. So like I said at the beginning, uh, this is not a uh, terms and conditions approach that we're taking here, but uh, Andy becomes a vital element. Uh, this process becomes a vital element in our incident response processes and fusion of information as we're dealing with uh, incidents, whether it be with a vendor or uh, you know direct uh, directed towards a particular company. But in particular, this starts to give you the framework for okay, this is a high-risk vendor, they have credentials to our environment, and they run critical business processes. So at my level, those are the quick snapshots and the bullet points I need to make a critical decision on the fly as to are we going to shut down access, defend the network, or do we uh, are we able to let business flow freely uh, with some risk mitigation in, in place? So all of that starts to play uh, and connect into this broader ecosystem of, of cybersecurity. Hmm. Very, very good points. I think, I think you know, and, and I think as a, as a next, I mean, I like really knowing uh, in depth what your high-risk third parties have, the data that you have, specifically the connection points, what they're actually doing is so critical. And I think you bring a good point, Sheldon, and, and maybe from the from the incident response process as well. I mean, to, to be prepared, to know what you need to shut down and what might affect your business or not, right? Because uh, uh, is I, I, that that's so important, and uh, I think that's going to be a topic of our next uh, our next task force as well. I mean, we touched on it and did some work here, but that's 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 really really very insightful. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to also point out the, the FAQs, which are some questions on, uh, on the minds of, of uh, third party risk managers and senior managers. Uh, you know, FAQs, some guidance on what are ways of convincing senior management to endorse a TPRM program. Again, I think solar winds help move that needle a little bit forward, uh, but there's still may need to be convincing. And, you know, honestly, if you're having a problem doing that and you're a member of the collaborative, uh, you know, you've got some peers that can probably provide some good slides and help you to do that. Uh, so that's another good reason to, to join if you're 
desiring to improve your third party risk management program. The second is addressing uh, risks of third parties outsourcing to fourth parties. This we see a lot. And again, going back to the statistics of 38% not being informed, you can contractually require third parties to do that. That doesn't mean they're going to do it. Probably, you know, let, you, you have to have a good management relationship processes to be informed of that and, and to prevent that from happening. But that's going to happen. They're going to go out to cloud providers and, and uh, you know, we have to be very much aware of that. Um, how many staff do I determine? How, how do I need? That's the you know, that comes speaks to the metrics and and, uh, and and seeing how you're doing and improving efficiency. How do I evaluate the security posture of CSPs, cloud service providers? Um, I don't know if you can send a customized 250 question questionnaire to uh, Amazon. If you've done that, uh, you know, you're, maybe maybe you've got the cloud to do it, but that's always a challenge is to, is to figure out the security posture of cloud service providers, although they may provide SOC to reports and some other things. Hey, Tom, can I jump in right there? Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's a there's a really important point here that Andy touched on earlier with some of our suppliers, in particular our customers might interact with a body shop or windshield repair or, you know, uh, something, a general contractor. Uh, so, uh, the, the key point here is how do you convince senior management? Well, especially if you're in a heavily regulated uh, industry, such as we are, financial services, many other industries, we have to know how our information is being handled by these third parties. And we have to know if fourth and fifth parties are standing behind those entities and whether they are utilizing our information. And I think we've found over the years, uh, governmental entities and others uh, are not taking too kind to, oh, well, you know, we signed off with a, a service provider and they screwed up. Uh, that doesn't cut it anymore. Yeah. Uh, they're contracted to us. We are responsible for our customers' information always. So that is uh, when I talked with my boss about you know doing this a year ago and creating an enterprise program about this. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of extra conversation. He's like, "Yep, let's do it. L let's go." It just made common sense. Well, that, that's that's great. You got the support, and and you're absolutely right. I mean, we can't punt it down the road. We are responsible for what happens. You know, you know, and you can do what you can contractually, but that's after the fact. I mean, you don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to be there. It's like having the impact of a breach, and now you're cleaning up. So, so I was glad. That's Brad, glad that your senior management was on board. And again, you know, regulators don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think CCPA or GDPR is going to, you know, accept the same type of thing either. So I can guarantee you they don't. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I can guarantee you they don't. I have. Uh, I have use cases to prove it. So, yeah. so, so we're hoping they're all being truthful. Uh, we can. We can talk about that. There, you know, some people use BitSight and some digital cards, some other things. Um, uh, some, sometimes uh, when they're filling out questionnaires, I seeing some clients attach it to the, you know, to the uh, contract saying, you know, your responses are now part of my legal agreement with you. So, or I'm going to put them there. So make sure that you're, you're being truthful. Um, we can, well, anyway, I, I'm going to have to move on because we need time for, for questions. And I'm just going to go through the standard and go through the workbook quickly. Um, the standard really uh, follows the organization and content of the guidance document. Um, it codifies the program. So, well, you know, one of the things is if you're putting in a program, you got to write a policy. So here's a good template to start. And uh, this is just an example of the first page. It's editable. You can do a find and replace. It isn't all find and replace. You got to tailor it to yourself. I mean, th there is a little bit of work you have to do behind this, uh, but uh, it, it will help you uh, get, get a good start. It does have the document control sheet. Uh, to meet with uh, ISO uh, requirements. So um, I'm leaving this in here, not that this, this is a big eye test for people. But I do want to talk about the, the workbook. I'm going to do a demo now. So I'm going to, uh, let's see if I can do a new share here. Um, yeah, let me do that. 
Uh, maybe uh, Andy or Shelley, can you see uh, the program workbook sign up? Thank you for <laughs> thank you for verifying that. I could I'll be talking and I'll be on a different slide. So um, this is for members who, who come in. Uh, clearly, some people have GRC tools and they have uh, questionnaires and they have uh, uh, inventory uh, third party inventory systems and. And, and, and that's all to the good, but not everybody does. Uh, they're still trying to figure that out. So what, what we've done is put a little workbook that will give those who are coming into the process, number one, a head start. Um, it, it has a uh, instruction sheet you know, for completing a security questionnaire. There's a register you can use and modify uh, for th uh, third parties. And then there's a, um, an activity log but the part of this workbook, I think that would be valuable to everyone who has a lot of third parties and are struggling with uh, you know, using questionnaires, you know, how many do I take a question and expand it? And, uh, and again, you know, depending on the risk levels, you may decide, well, for my serious ones, I, I might give them this, but I'm really gonna go into a lot of detail and, and, and do more. And that's perfectly appropriate. But we do have a tool for you that's readily usable. Um, uh, it's it, again, it's something uh, that uh, you can send out to a third party. Uh, it's locked down. They they actually you know fill it out. So often uh, you know you can ask for security certifications. Again, watch the scope on that. They might say uh, they got a SOC two certification, but it's really their fourth party that has it. So you have to you have to be a little careful on that. I'm sure I'm sure people have done that. But um, it's easy to fill out. There's a drop down option. It, we look at the major security domains. There's a drop down option, you know, uh, about the degree to which they inventory their information, uh, the extent to which they have policies and administer them, the, the extent to which they actually have a formal security organization or not, um, how they use risk assessments, do they do vulnerability and penetration testing, do they have a supplier management program? incident response, data, uh, data disaster recovery. So those are all drop downs, best answer, and they can put their comments in here. And then they, there's a checkbox again, how much do they do in the security awareness side? Maybe they just, it's just new hires, maybe not contractors. Uh, do they do log management, access management, patch management, uh, devices? The two um, questions that we kind of uh, like and have evolved to uh, at the end is, are they, are they really uh, doing a lot with two-factor authentication? It, it's a real, real uh, attack factor if people aren't doing that, at least for remote access is the obvious one, but privilege access as well. And there are some companies that require on-site use, user access, but again, people working from home, probably VPN and two-factor, and then um, ransomware defenses. This could go on and on and on, but we look for, you know, are you training them? Uh, is there, are they backed up? Is local admin controlled, et cetera? Um, so let me just put a new share on. I'm just going to show you briefly. Uh, and Tom, as you're, as you're pulling that through, I'll, I'll add just one, one bit to this. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you know, everybody here, especially the risk analysts, are probably saying, well, what's the difference between this and the, the Santa Fe Group's SIG form, Standard Information Gathering form? And the SIG form is good from the perspective of you need to cast a net a mile wide and figure out what's what risks you might have. But the reality is, is we're starting programs here. We're not trying to capture every single risk. We're trying to get to the risks that are very important, very important to our individuals and our business. So what we did through planning this is we really looked at the, the items, the questions, the controls that were critical for that success factor, right? To make sure that we're identifying the biggest and most impactful things that protect your company. And one thing I'll add, and I, and, and I wanna say this because every time multi-factor authentication is brought up, I'm gonna add this, this comment, for everybody on the call is one of the best ways to protect your company and yourself, bar none. I have, if an, and that just shameless plug, I have no affiliation. Darknet uh, Diaries is about all these cyber attacks throughout history that happened. If you listen to the theme of that, and you listen to all these big events, almost all of them, big portion of them can be prevented uh, through just having MFA. So I'm plugging it in there to the group. Make sure if you, if you want to take one thing away today, start mm -hmm. looking into that as your number one. And then yeah. go from there. That's how I, my pen and trust station just used to always get in, uh, you know, just cracking up and finding something on that basis. So thank you for saying that. It's near and dear to my heart. And I think it's sage advice for everyone here. 
Um, let me kind of quickly get through this. Uh, Connor, you can, uh, if you want to pull, pull the poll uh, question up in, a, in just a minute, we'll do that. Um, let me just make sure I can do that. Okay, so what happens is this comes, this comes back to you and uh, it's locked so the user can't see it. I'm gonna unhide it. I just wanted to show you, we do have a, oh, I didn't do that, let's see if I can do that. Uh, unhide, there we go, okay. Um, I got all kinds of things open here, it's a little bit. So what we do is we score, uh, provide a score, and, and actually there's instructions, so you can change the scoring on here, add questions and do what you wanna do. Um, but there shouldn't be any incomplete responses. If there are the scoring will occur, they have to answer every question. Uh, so uh, obviously you might have to go back and if there are something that's incomplete uh, to, to do it. And that's for the drop downs. Uh, they can leave the others incomplete, which means they don't have uh, certain things. Then there are red flags, missing components to a security program. And you can walk through and see like, uh, I don't have policies, I don't do penetration testing. Now everyone complains about the cost of pen testing, but uh, by golly, whether you do it internally or externally, it is just a really sound way to test your program. Um, and again, you can make your own judgments on this. Uh, everyone's judgments are different. And so then we come up with a total score. Uh, so it, it does give you a, a, a total scoring capability that you can, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can follow. So let me go back to the uh, PowerPoint. That's available to all members. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, we can see this. Am I back on the PowerPoint, guys? Hopefully. Very good. Thank you. So um, the work does continue. We'll get to the Q&A after this. Um, one of the things that um, we found here was very interesting. Um, we're going to have a new task force on this again, looking at the third and fourth uh, parties aspect to this. Uh, looking at third parties that provide software uh, to us and, and how to validate their security controls. Um, continue on improving the workbook. Um, I just wanted to mention that I think earlier on that we have a supplier contract SLA data security addendum uh, that members can uh, reference and use, modify uh, for their contracts with suppliers, uh, which require data protections from the suppliers on that. This is something that was just provided. And this happens frequently uh, in the collaborative uh, where, where people do provide uh, these kinds of things. And we actually have had a team on DevOps security considerations uh, by one of our members uh, who provides uh, software to companies and was looking at it from the perspective, of, I don't wanna be owned and, and be the next SolarWinds if I may use them again. Uh, so how do I, how do I uh, stop from doing that. And we're putting together a good paper on their best practices. We're going to turn that around and bring that into our next uh, task force because those that guidance is, is really sage. And how do we turn that over so we can find out how, how third parties are doing the same thing? Uh, the new initiatives are uh, one that's going to be coming up. We're really going to be looking at and, and Sheldon talked about it. Uh, we call raising ransomware for, for those who are listening. It's not R-A-I-S-I-N-G. We're not trying to grow it. We're trying to uh, get rid of it. So raising ransomware, your prevention, detection, and response playbook. We think of playbooks and incident management, but we're, we're really looking to put together an entire package together that members can use to, to address all aspects of uh, protecting you and responding uh, to, uh, to ransomware. So uh, we're kind of, uh, and, and we do actually have a simulation exercise uh, ready to go for members that come in. And then there'll be another on zero trust. Really a uh, great concept, but there are some uh, good members here uh, who have moved in that direction and have good insights. So that's gonna be a, a second, uh, another team again, in addition to the supply chain security and third and fourth parties. So we're very excited. We want, uh, we want you, to, you know, our existing members to sign up for these teams. And uh, we certainly uh, would, would like our guests here to reach out to us, talk more about us and become part of the collaborative because these are really apropos topics and uh, they can make some significant uh, differences to your organizations. 
So we're going to go into the Q and A um, uh, uh, session. Sheldon, I mean, I'm, excuse, I'm sorry. I think Connor got his poll questions. Hopefully, all up there. Uh, you know, please make sure you answer those. Um, I want to remind everyone. Uh, you know, this is this your title to a CPE credit here. I mean, uh, uh, you know, certainly um, we hope and we know there's some educational value out of this, especially you know having Sheldon and Andy here and, and seeing the work of the task force. So, um, so by all means, uh, leverage this time to get that credit. If you want a copy of this presentation, well, we'll make sure members have it. It will be on the portal, but uh, please uh, email us at membership at cyberleadersunite.com. You can see it on here, and we're happy to provide you uh, with a copy of this presentation. Um, so I'm just going to go to the Q. Well, we have 30, 32 uh, Q&As. <laughs> Not much time to deal with them. Um, so let me just, uh, I'm just going to kind of take them. Through. If you don't mind, Tom, there's a, there's a question. There's actually a, a two or three questions related to the same topic, and I wouldn't mind just kicking it off, addressing it. Well, um, you will certainly help me. Do you, do you want to go ahead? Absolutely. Yeah, if, yeah, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, it, don't mind because all. it's something that I'm dealing with right now, and I'm, I'm very, very interested in it. And yeah. that it, it's evolving around cyber incidents and third party and how you start getting that Venn diagram a little closer together so you can enable each other. Um, and I've been working very closely with our own cyber fusion teams to um, develop data sets and questions and, and surveys to quickly make business impacting decisions, or sorry, solutioning decisions in those events. So to minimize business impact, um, it, you know, so I'll say this, I definitely think there, there needs to be clear communications between your cyber threat teams uh, your defense teams and your risk teams. That has to happen. Um, you know, depending how big your company is and how many members of your organization, that might be a, a challenge, but I really recommend taking a look at, at least from a third party side, how do you manage that threat? One of the ways I've been successful doing that is I alluded to it early on, is the identification part of third party. I uh, work very frequently with our threat hunters and give them those, those threat, uh, we call them attack vectors, that could be uh, in, in, uh, at risk during an event. So how you approach that, I would, again, I would start looking at what do they need to know? Like start with the C-level. When I said, what are your biggest risks? What are your biggest concerns? Go over to your threat team saying, hey, what data would help you out, right? What can, what can I get for you ahead of time and investigate for you ahead of time? It's, it's pretty funny because it used to be asking the business lines what their threats are. And I've actually kind of taken that same methodology and moved right over to our, our frontline cybersecurity teams and say, what can I get you to make you more responsive and even more effective in your role? Um, it, you just have to ask those questions because every, again, every industry is different. Everybody has a different threat or, or different uh, um, issue that they have to manage. Manufacturing is dealing more about their, you know, their global supply chain and how their, their goods are coming in. They got to be really well aware of, of those bottlenecks. Um, you know, insurance is all about the sharing data. I go back because that's where our knowledge is. Um, we have to be very clear on those services that are being provided. So kind of shorting that up a little bit, I definitely think you guys should start having the conversation and talking. I think that's where the future is for third-party risk management. And I talk about, you know, if we talk about next phase, uh, next decade where I see it, I see those teams really coming together and being a stack of teams. Risk, threat hunting, cyber fusion, they're really like one team all together working circular issues to investigate a threat. Yeah, I, you, you, again, you, you, I have to say, the way third parties go, you have to now look at them as as they're you know they're your next door neighbor ne next door neighbors they're in your living room, you know. I mean, it wasn't they were next door neighbors and you know you had a you had a white picket fence, you know. They're 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 right there, and you're right. You've got to look at them like any threat and talk to your threat teams and 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 let them do red team blue team types of exercises, right? And, and with that information. Uh, and, and then think about this as far as incident management and expand, expand your view of this rather than I'm just coming up with a risk assessment and I'm going to put you over in this category and I'm going to write this in the contracts. Very forward thinking that we, we, need, to, we need to do. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I'll jump in with another question I saw here in terms of uh, there was a question on GRC. And uh, so, yes, RSA Archer on spring, you know, whatever your pick is that you can look at, you know, the Gartner 
uh, Gartner scores for that. But one of the things that we're looking at is, and you know, there are many things to build, right? So by having this as a workbook that we've directly contributed to, we're able to take these questions now, port it into our GRC, and then send that out to suppliers as opposed to doing the email approach and you know waiting for responses and then things get lost. And so that's a part of our future state that we're working towards now that this is done, now that our GRC is done, I plug these two things together to maximize uh, the impact and the benefit of that, thereby automating these actions so that when the next solar winds happens, and Andy needs to go out and contact 90 plus suppliers and figure out if they have solar winds in their environment. We just push a button instead of all the manual uh, handling that that we do today. Yeah, um, GRC tools configured properly, you know, uh, can be extremely useful for for doing that. Unlike Excel spreadsheets, I mean, we know that um, Excel uh, has helped us all a lot, but but uh, to a, to a certain limit. But I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, it, you know, if you can actually understand their components and what they have, you, you, you have more knowledge and ability to respond and prevent certain things. I mean, you know, you, you, you just have more wherewithal. And a lot of people bring in GRC tools, in my experience, have started with a third party risk management, uh, uh, you know, model. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of my point is you don't skip the maturity levels, right? So, uh, or, uh, the, the quote is great, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Well, you still have to work that business process. And just because I bought a GRC solution, it doesn't solve my problem. So that's the point where we've done the business process for the, that side of it. Now we can automate it through a tool and not vice versa. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Hey, here's another um, uh, question. And, and again, some of the questions are, you know, some of the members are looking for the guide. We'll take care. We'll make sure you get all that information. So does anyone use or put credence in third-party monitoring services such as UpGuard security scorecard? Thoughts on their efficacy? I don't know if, uh, if, if you've used them, Andy and Sheldon. Uh, <laughs> we have, I don't know, Sheldon, if you wanna go first, maybe you have a little bit of history I can add some flavor too. Uh, you go first, yeah. This okay. Is... <laughs> so this is interesting, and it's, I'm going to be careful here because um, you know everybody has a different need for their tools and looking at different features to enable their business line. Um, I'll, I'll kind of share without you know advertising all of our tool sets. There was one particular that really put a good flavor on um, on risk and put it loss evaluation on if a uh, an event should occur, whether it's an availability breach, confidentiality breach. Uh, it provided value. And, and for me, I'm able to take that information then and not just do the normal, you know, notify of potential threats to our threat teams, but also go to our business partners and say, hey, if, if this vendor goes down with the amount of records they own and they're, they're responsible for, it costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you know, in, in the way they calculate that. So it's interesting um, that, that it's able to produce that capability. But again, there's there's other needs like you may need something like uh, I use BitSight because BitSight is very popular. I think everybody should be familiar with that name. Um, they're very much into the details. They give you a lot of granularity and then you extract that and use that data how you need in your system process. So you can feed it into GRC systems or whatever you need to do. It all depends on where you need to go and how mature you are. What I would recommend is if you guys are looking at third party monitoring, go with, Mark, go with Gartner first, see who's out there, see who's a player. But I'd also challenge you to really think about what you're trying to address and how much you can address. Because you might need a tool that could do more of the, the graphical, more of the fuzzy, because you're presenting that to your business stakeholders versus um, if I had like a, a bit site working directly with your technical teams to resolve some of those issues. So there's different flavors for the different needs. Um, I wouldn't say there's any one that is terrible because they're all collecting data that is useful for us. But you do have to be careful because false positives are a real thing. Because when they're scanning their environments and they're trying to collect this, this publicly available information, it is possible that the areas they're scanning are not public, or, or excuse me, not production environments. They don't have any data on there. They gotta be careful for chasing those ghosts because they will, they will cause you a lot of cycles uh, investigation. So that's what one recommendation. Thank you very, yeah, thank Yeah, we can talk about that. I was gonna ask about SOC 2 reports and their value, but I, we're, we're kind of at the top of the hour. First of all, I'd like to thank um, uh, Sheldon and Andy for 
spending your whole time here and, and you know I mean and, and also Andy for your work on the on the team and Sheldon for your your executive guidance on this and I'm, I'm glad you know well, personally you know selfishly glad you're able to make the hour here and not on the other thing it meant a lot to have you here both of you and I'd also like to thank um, all the support team uh, that, that, that helps our members and and uh, the members for, for for joining today and all your contributions and for those uh, who are interested in, uh, in, in in understanding more about the collaborative and joining, I, I encourage you to reach out to us, and, uh, and and we will help you in any way. Um, it, it it is such a valuable organization, and we're all in this together. Things are changing so fast that we have to get information quickly as quickly as well. So again, thank you. Have a, a very very uh, wonderful afternoon, and uh, we'll see you at the at the next virtual briefing. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody.